out today. I know it's um, an interesting week going into the holidays. I've noticed the, at least at our brokerage, trading volumes kind of fall into a dribble. So I assume that most people are doing other things besides trading and watching the markets. And that's a good thing. Um, I always encourage, uh, this is a complete random side note, but I always encourage our brokerage clients to kind of take it easy in December. After Thanksgiving, things really start to thin out. The markets do weird things, kind of like what we're seeing today. Uh, big, strange moves that uh, if you happen to get caught in the wrong place at the wrong time can be pretty painful. So it's usually a good idea to tread lightly during the holidays. So with that said, we're going to talk about speculating in gold with less risk than would be the case if you were trading uh, full-size futures or outright futures, that sort of thing. We're going to talk about option spreads and smaller futures. And when I say small, it, we're going to talk about a couple different things, uh, minis, micros, and also a new product that's listed on the smalls exchange that many of you may not even be aware of. My name's Carly Garner. I am a futures and options broker, so keep that in mind as we go. I'm obviously biased towards trading futures and options and not ETFs, and we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, mostly because, not mostly, but it is because I do this for a living, but it's also because I do think there's some definite advantages to doing so, and we'll talk about those. If you're on social media, check us out at Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. We have 30 or 40 educational videos on YouTube, as well as on our website, DeCarly Trading. So if you're looking to learn, you can do so for free. Uh, by the way, if you do follow us on social media or follow me on social media, you're probably going to see a lot of dog pictures. This is Frankie, and this was taken right outside Las Vegas. I know people have a hard time believing that because they see green in the background, and that's not what they think of when they think of Las Vegas. But we actually do have a mountain 20 miles out of town. So again, I'm a broker, but I'm also a strategist and an author. I write a monthly column for Stocks and Commodities Magazine. I provide content and analysis to Jim Cramer's Mad Money, as well as Bloomberg Television. There's a segment every day on Bloomberg at around, uh, let's see, 3 o'clock Eastern time, roughly. And I'm on roughly once a week, once every other week, with Abigail Doolittle talking about options and commodity markets. I also write a couple in-house newsletter, the letters, the Financial Futures Report and the DeCarly Perspective, which we provide to our clients free of charge, our brokerage clients. And I've written a handful of books. If you do, if you are interested and you go to Amazon, that's the cheapest place to get them, but you can honestly get them at any major book outlet. Um, just focus on these three, forget about everything else. You'll see about seven and that's because we've switched publishers and so we republished, what well, we rewrote and republished a few of them. We also have multiple editions of a couple of them, but just focus on these, ignore everything else. These are the freshest versions. And what we're gonna talk about today is uh, option spreads, butterflies, and that is covered in much more detail in trading commodity options with creativity. But if you're looking more for market analysis type of things, higher probability commodity trading is a better source. So there is a substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options. It's not suitable for everybody. And in fact, it's probably not suitable for most people. And of course, we're gonna talk about gold. Everybody loves gold. Everybody loves the idea of gold. They like talking about it. When we talk to new traders or new clients, the first thing they wanna talk about is gold. And you know, there's good reasons for that. It can be a very explosive market and it gets a lot of press. So people, uh, either know a lot about gold or they think they know a lot about gold. It is known by many as the quintessential commodity. Some people believe it's a good store of value. Some people believe it's a high quality long-term investment. You often hear that it's a hedge against inflation. Most people assume gold and dollar move together. 
And you also hear it referred to as a safe haven. However, that's not, those things are not necessarily true. Sometimes they're true, but not always. So you don't wanna get caught up in the idea of assuming that these things are always true. Sometimes gold and dollar move together. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes gold is a wonderful safe haven. Sometimes it's not. And we're, if, while we're on the subject, the word safe haven is probably used a little too loosely in most contexts. I believe that the only real safe haven is maybe cash, even though we can all agree that you're losing buying power with cash, but at least you're probably not gonna lose your principal. Whereas um, there are times that gold sees dramatic drawdowns, even treasury, US treasuries. You can see some really big uh, volatile moves in treasuries. So can it be a safe haven? Yes, but is it always no? In my opinion, gold is not a buy and hold market all, in most circumstances. It's more of a trader's market or a diversifier's market. And the reason I say that is if you look at the numbers beyond 1980, owning gold has mostly been waiting and seeing. We've seen some really big runs over a handful of years, but then those runs are uh, interrupted by drawdowns or pauses that last several years maybe even a decade. In the most recent situation, we saw gold peak in 2011 and didn't really start to catch ground, catch traction and make new highs until just this year. So if you bought in 2011 and you held on, it would have taken you nine years to get your money back. And you may not even quite be there after you consider if you're buying bullion storage and holding costs and things like that. So there's a lot of things to consider. The time and place for gold is, it's simply not always. And you can see by, this is a monthly chart. It dates back to the early 2000s. So we're looking at 20 years worth of gold prices. And you can see that gold has had some really nice runs, but it also has some pretty painful pullbacks for anybody that's trying to be a buy and hold investor. Okay, sorry. So obviously we had a really nice run here in the late 2000s, which was followed by a decade of declining gold prices or, or at least stagnant gold prices. And then of course we've had this year has been a nice run in gold. What happens next is anybody's guess. We'll talk about this a little later, but I actually uh, have an unpopular opinion. I think that gold's probably seen the high, at least for the foreseeable future. And I think we have a pretty, pretty decent sized correction ahead of us. I know that we've had a correction already, but I'm not convinced it's necessarily over, but we'll see. I mean, unfortunately, we don't uh, have crystal balls, or if we do, those crystal balls are not foolproof. And one thing that keeps me a little bit on edge when it comes to assuming that gold's going to continue higher, I mean, there's a lot of things, but uh, just one thing in particular I'm looking at is the RSI. Even with this little pullback that we've seen, and you can see this chart is actually missing the latest monthly bar. So of course, gold's uh, rallied just a little bit from the screenshot. Nonetheless, the RSI on a monthly chart in gold is about 70. Whether it's gold or most other markets, when you see an RSI of 70 or higher on a monthly chart, it's pretty rare that that those levels hold. You usually get some sort of big pullback to alleviate that overbought status, just like we saw here in 2008, like we saw in 2011. So just be aware that gold can go down sometimes. In fact, it generally goes down for, um, I don't wanna say prolonged periods of time, but when gold does drop, it, it often does so pretty fiercely. So you don't want to be on the wrong side of that. Also, a lot of people were thinking uh, a week or two ago when gold was trading in 1800, they were thinking that was cheap. But gold is really far from cheap. As you can see, trend line resistance, depending on how you draw it, might not be for several hundred dollars below where we are now.
Okay, so I know this is a little depressing for people that are rooting for gold to go higher, but I'm just trying to give everybody the big picture. And I could obviously be wrong. We could, maybe we'll see 24, 2500 gold. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but with that said, we should also just keep in mind the big picture. Gold really has little industrial or practical use in society. It doesn't pay dividends. Even gold mining stocks, really dividends tend to be on the low side. But the great thing about gold is there's quite a bit of market volatility. And what I've noticed is the options have been really overpriced for most of 2020, or at least since March. And that's created a lot of opportunities for traders of all risk levels and sizes. Whether you're looking for limited risk and you wanna to put together some sort of option spread like a butterfly, or you're looking to sell premium, there are, is a ton of premium built into the options. And so there are actually some really great opportunities for option traders, regardless of the risk and reward that you're looking for. So the great thing about gold also is it's a diversifier. Most people assume that if the stock market's going up, gold is going down and vice versa. That is not necessarily true. It can be true. We've seen periods of time where that is true. Whoops, like here and here. But more often than not, they actually go up together. Um, you could, a lot of people might say that's because of inflation. It might, they might say that it's money coming into the economy. I mean, what happened here? Quantitative easing. So there's all kinds of things that we could attribute it to, but the reality is just because the stock market goes up doesn't mean gold's gonna go down and vice versa. In fact, um, a lot of times it's, they move together. So let's talk about the difference between trading gold futures and trading gold ETFs. Again, I'm a futures broker, so my opinion is biased, but I do think there's definitely some really good arguments for trading gold in the futures markets because simply they are more efficient. Gold futures represent actual delivery of gold at expiration of that contract, which means that futures contract is gonna be priced more efficiently than an ETF is. Now, in defense of ETFs in the case of gold, which is not the case in many other commodities such as crude oil and USO or natural gas and UNG and those things, those ETFs actually take investor money and purchase futures, which makes them extremely inefficient. And we saw that especially this year in, in uh, crude oil when the USO ETF basically blew up is literally what happened and it took the crude oil futures market down with it. So with that said, uh, the gold ETF is a much better product than some of the other commodity ETFs. I will say that. However, gold futures, not only are they more efficient, they are more accessible. Gold futures trade 23 hours per day. They open up on Sunday evening. If you're on the East Coast or if you're on the West Coast, like I am, it's actually Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. So you can trade from Sunday afternoon all the way through to Friday afternoon, almost around the clock. There's a one hour pause during the day, but this, this gives you market access. So that's important because, you know, we're not everything happens during the, the US day session. Sometimes things are happening overseas in China or um, Europe, whatever the case is. Remember the Brexit deal a couple of years ago when the markets went haywire, that all occurred while the US markets were closed. So as a futures trader, you have access to your positions, liquid markets, the ability to buy or sell, your stop orders to be working, so on and so forth around the clock. Also, futures are more tax efficient. You, as a trader, whether you're trading futures or options on futures, you, uh, are taxed at a 60-40 blend, or I should say a 40-60 blend between long-term and short-term capital gains rates. And the other great thing about trading futures is the contracts are leveraged, which of course can work against you if you're too aggressive or if you're just simply wrong, the leverage is gonna work against you. However, there are small contracts that have leverage built in, but 
uh, they're so small that you could fully fund an account. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But you basically, in, in a nutshell, you can eliminate the leverage and still get all the other benefits. Okay, so gold futures come in many sizes. The original gold contract, which is what most people are referring to when they talk about gold or gold futures, symbol is GC, it's 100 ounces of gold, which represents $180,000 worth of gold if gold's valued at 1800. That's a lot of gold, especially for the average retail trader. You can make or lose a, a, a good amount of money in a very short amount of time. I've seen gold move 80 to to $100 in a day. That's $8,000 to $10,000 per contract. I mean, that, that doesn't happen often. It's more often 10 or $20 a day, which is 1,000 to 2,000. Still a lot of money for most traders. There's an E-mini gold. It's 50 ounces, half the size. So you're trading roughly $90,000 worth of gold. The margin on that is about six grand, half of what you would pay to pay the, to trade the full size. There's a kilo gold, which most people aren't aware of. It's 32.15 ounces. A year or two ago, it was too illiquid to trade. Liquidity has come into that very nicely. And so that's definitely something that you could consider, which is a nice, happy medium. The margin's less than three grand and you're trading about $60,000 worth of gold. The smallest gold futures contract traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange is the micro. It's 10 ounces. You're trading $18,000 worth of gold for a margin requirement of less than 1,300. The nice thing about this is, if you have a $20,000 trading account and you buy or sell a micro gold, you've essentially executed a position with zero leverage, right? Because the contract is worth 18,000 and you have 20,000 in your account. So you've eliminated all the leverage. Or if you only wanna use a small amount of leverage, maybe you could trade two contracts you're, you're trading roughly $39,000 worth of gold in a $20,000 account. So you get the idea. You can control your leverage and you can reduce your leverage and your risk. A product that most people are not aware of, and to be honest, most brokerages, most brokerage firms don't necessarily even list these products at this point is uh, their products called the Smalls. They trade on the Smalls Exchange. It's a new exchange and it offers index trading in small, simpl simplified and partially diversified futures contracts. So what this means is uh, in precious metals, you can trade an index that has a contract value of roughly 7,000. Of course, this fluctuates with the market, a margin of $440 and you make or lose a dollar a tick. So this is something that you could buy or, and hold or sell and hold if you're bearish without a whole lot of stress. But if you catch a move, you might, uh, you might make a little money. So anyway, this is the Smalls Exchange. Our brokerage does offer these contracts. Most brokerages maybe do not, but they're really great because not only are they small and easy, easier to manage, so you can position trade, you don't have to worry about being in and out for margin purposes. They are somewhat diversified, so you don't have to pick between gold and silver. You can kind of, I mean, assuming you're bearish or bullish, both of them at the same time, you could trade them both in this one product, and it's basically an index. Not unlike a stock index or something else that is a little bit diversified. So gold futures can be confusing. And one thing I want to point out is when you pull up your trading platform, you're probably going to, if you type in the word gold and you search for symbols, you're probably going to see these two symbols. Stay away from them. Be aware of what you're trading. If you see anything with a Z, ZG or ZYG, these are traded on the ICE exchange. Years ago, this was the mini gold that everybody traded but the ICE exchange has been extremely unfriendly to retail traders. 
So the speculators have basically jumped ship and gone to the CME products. You don't want to get caught in one of these. There's a lot of issues with the, with the ICE gold. First of all, the ICE exchange charges $140 a month just for price data. So if you do get into this trade, you're not going to be able to see live quotes unless you pay the exchange $140 a month. That's no fun. It also lacks liquidity. It has fewer trading hours and fewer order types different rules on stops. So just trust me on this. You don't want to trade these. If you see a Z in front of the symbol, stay away. If you're not sure which product you're trading, you want to make sure you're trading the CME products, call your broker. They need, they'll hopefully be able to answer your question. Believe it or not, not all brokers can answer that simple question, but they hopefully they can. Make sure you know what you're trading. I've seen traders, not necessarily with the metals, but I've seen traders get into products that they didn't fully understand, for example, they were wanting to trade coffee on the ICE exchange and ironically got into coffee on the CME exchange, which has no volume and they couldn't get out of it. So you don't want to be that person. Make sure you know what you're doing. Another thing to keep in mind is if you're trading gold options, the gold options are written against the CME's 100 ounce contract. So we're talking about um, the fact that the options are against the big contract, mean, which means they're expensive to buy. The margin is high if you're selling them. They can be dangerous to sell. At the moment, I just got done telling you a few slides ago that there's a lot of opportunities for option sellers because the premium is so high, and that's absolutely true. But you really need to understand what you're getting into if you're going to sell options, especially if you're going to sell gold calls. And the reason I say that is, somebody trading earlier this year, March or April, uh, might have been tempted to sell call options with really fat premiums way out of the money. And honestly, on paper, they were a great trade. And if they had the money to hold those positions, they probably ended up being an excellent trade. But between entry and expiration of the option, it could get, it could have gotten pretty expensive. For example, I saw call options with strike prices and the high 2600s, 2700s, 2800s, just completely explode in value. It didn't matter that gold never got over 2100. Those options got really, really expensive. So anybody that was short those had a hard time writing them out. So you wanna, uh, if you're gonna sell options, just understand what you're getting into. It's not for the faint of heart and it's not for somebody that doesn't necessarily fully understand the risks or isn't well-funded. The biggest issue with option selling that I see, and I am an advocate of premium collection, believe it or not, but I do think you should probably have insurance in place. That said, where people really get into trouble is they simply run out of money. Sometimes temporary volatility spikes, they may only last a couple of days, but sometimes that's enough to completely wipe out a trader's account before the market turns the other way. So you don't want to be caught in a situation like that. But the nice thing about all the volatility and the implied volatility that's pumping up the option prices is that it's created opportunities for butterfly trading. Butterflies are not perfect. We'll talk about the drawbacks of those, but they offer traders limited risk, no margin and very large profit potential. Um, someone's saying that the CME is showing no volume for kilo gold. It, uh, you probably want to make sure you're looking at the February. I do believe the CME at, does list all the um, every month. Like, for example, you might see January, March, May. Those months, nobody will trade for roughly any size contract, to be honest. But the kilo for the main, like February's, April's, and June's should be pretty liquid. Not super liquid but liquid enough to trade. And during normal market hours, there's bid ask, uh, there's market makers that make bid ask spreads pretty tight. So you shouldn't have any problem. So what moves gold? There are an unlimited things we could talk, number of things we could talk about as far as what moves the price of gold. But there's a few things that, that we're gonna talk about that probably aren't on most people's radar. People are wanting to talk about the Fed, the money printing, the weakening dollar, all those sorts of things. But here's some things to keep in mind that are always 
working for or against prices. So in my opinion, gold is an asset similar to fine art or baseball cards. It has substantial value, but mostly because humans say it does, not necessarily because there's some intrinsic value there. But there are, there are three things that we like to look at when we're analyzing the gold market. Seasonality, the COT report, and technical analysis. This is the uh, seasonal chart of gold. This is um, offered to us by our friends at Moore Research Center. They, if you're not familiar with Moore, it's a great service. I, the last I checked, the pricing was roughly 30, 35 bucks a month. And you'll have a database of seasonals for all futures contracts, as well as several other stats, um, intercommodity spreads, all these types of fun things. And they actually have, do offer spread trading recommendations if you're interested in that. But the important thing to know here is gold generally, and one thing I should say about seasonals are, seasonals are not perfect. Following seasonals isn't gonna guarantee you're gonna win or make money. In fact, there obviously are no guarantees. But the, the idea is more often than not, certain commodities make certain moves during certain times of the year. So in gold, generally there's a run early in the year, January and February. And then there's another run in the late summer or early fall. The market doesn't have to follow this pattern, but it does more often than it doesn't. So it's a good idea to be aware of it. The other thing we keep an, on, an eye on is the COT report. This is the Commitment of Traders report. It's issued by the CFTC. And it basically, in a nutshell, I'll give you the skinny version. They tell us what group of traders and the groups are large speculators, small speculator, and commercials. They tell us those three groups, who's long, who's short, and how much. And what we pay attention to, I mean, there's a, the report has other information, but we're going to focus on that for now. What we pay attention to is the large speculator because they're supposedly the, the deep pockets. And in theory, you would assume they would be a little more experienced and know what they're doing. Anytime that we see the large speculator has built a position and it's accumulated to something larger than the norm, the market tends to run out of buyers. And it's a very simple explanation. The idea is if everybody that's bullish in a market has already bought, who's, who's left to buy? Probably not very many people. But if everybody's long, eventually they're going to start selling, right? The only way to get out of a market is to sell. So unless they're hanging on for a decade, which some gold traders do, eventually they're going to want to get out of the market, maybe take a profit or take a loss. So when the COT report shows that speculators are getting a little too comfortable on the long side, the rally tends to stall. At this particular moment, we can see that gold traders are long, but they're not obscenely long. So I don't think it's any, uh, any indicator that the market's going to completely melt down anytime soon. But that doesn't mean it won't. It just means that we're not getting a signal on this particular piece of analysis. But if you are somebody that's been long gold and you do notice that the COT report starts suggesting that specs are really long and they're aggressively long, you may want to protect your profits, take, you know, maybe even play the other side, who knows, but be weary. So when the market becomes overcrowded, you tend to see pretty sizable corrections. And this is just to kind of put things in perspective. Gold is a really emotional market. It always overshoots equilibrium, whether it's going up or down. That's just how this market works. And we can see it here. The equilibrium, equilibrium it's probably about 20, 1260, 1250. The market overshot it overshot it on the downside and then came back and settled there at least for a little while. So that's just how gold works. It also tends to correct 25 to 40% in a single clip. 
didn't mark it on here, but these are essentially, I think this is a 20% correction or 24%. This is a 30 something correct percent correction. This is about a 40% correction here. So let's assume that gold corrects 25%, which is on the lower end of what we've seen in the last 20 years. That would put gold at about 1570. If gold correct, corrected 40%, that'd put us down at 1260, which is essentially the equilibrium price based on the last decade and where the rally started from. So do I think this is gonna happen? Honestly, I really think we'll at least see 15, the mid 15s, and then we'll have to kind of see what it does from there. Could I be wrong? Yes, but this is how I'm looking at things, at least for now. I do also, I know this is an unpopular opinion, but I do think the dollar is probably gonna find a bottom much sooner than most people think. Even if it's just for a few months, the dollar bounces out of here, that's gonna put some pressure on gold. We'll see. So let's take a look at a gold butterfly. Butterflies provide opportunities for low and limited risk range trading in high volatility environments. Now, if gold was trading quietly around 2650, like we saw uh, in the last slide, butterflies would not be a good way to play it because the volatility of, in the options would be such that you'd have to have your spreads way too narrow and, or they'd be too expensive because you couldn't collect enough premium to pay for what you needed to pay for. But in an environment like this where the premiums are fat, it's worth a shot in many cases. So let's talk about what we're talking about here. I should also mention that despite all the good things that come with butterfly trading, there are some negatives. You can be, with a butterfly, you're range trading. So you can be too right. If you put a call butterfly together and the market rallies, but it rallies beyond your, your, your range trade, you lose money even though you are right. Also for a material profit to emerge, the trade must be held to expiration. So you kind of get handcuffed in the trade. Of course you can get out at any time, but if you're, if you're looking to pull some sort of profit out of it, a lot of times you have to hold all the way to expiration or at least close to expiration. And also we're gonna talk about some trades here that you'll, you might get excited because you're gonna see very low risks and very high profit potential. But the odds of you actually squeezing out the entire full profit potential is unlikely. Okay, so a butterfly consists of the purchase of two options and the sale of two options. The first option that you purchase is the money maker. In this case, it's a put fly. So we're buying a 1750 put. We are selling two 1700 puts to pay for that. And then we're buying a 1650 put as insurance. That caps our risk. So if we look at the premiums over here, these, this is the bid ask of each option. We're paying roughly $19 or $1,900 for the 1750. If you wanted to buy that option outright, that's what you'd have to pay is 1900. Of course, spending that much on an option is, is a tough game. That's a lot of money to risk on one trade and options are priced to lose. So in order to cut the cost and risk down, we sell the two 1700s for about 800 each. And then to make sure that the risk is limited and not unlimited, we purchase this extra put. If you did not purchase the extra put and the market dropped below 1700, you would start giving the profits back that you made between your $50 spread. And then you'd eventually run out of money at 1650. And below that you'd have unlimited risk. So let's take a look at what this would look like in a chart.
Okay, so this is a couple of weeks ago. Somebody that uh, thought that gold might be going lower would, now we know two weeks later, we know that gold did not go lower. It did a little bit, but then it bounced pretty hard and went higher. But the point of this trade is, if you think gold's going lower, selling into the hole, to, hole is usually a, a dangerous game, right? If gold fails to fall apart and bounces higher, you could be out a lot of money if you sold a futures contract. So this is one way to put on a bearish trade without really risking the farm. In fact, in this situation, the trader's risking roughly 680 bucks plus transaction costs. The most he can make is about 4,300. But no matter what happens, even if gold rallies to 2,200, you, you're still only out the 680. So in a situation like this, you're, it's a range trade. You're making money if gold falls in here at expiration. And again, we're buying the 1750 put, selling two 1700 puts, and then buying a 1650 put. So if the market's above 1750 up here, you lose 680. If it's below, you lose 680. But if it's anywhere between 1750 and 1650, that's a 100 point range, the trade pays off something but you paid 680 to get in. So in order for you to actually turn a profit on the trade, the market's gotta be between the two break even points, which is you take 1750 minus, 16 by, minus 680. So it's somewhere around the, the 4, 1743 area on the upside, but you get the idea. It's, it's a way to get a foot in the door without really betting the farm. Also, there's no margin on this trade. So no margin limited risk, no stress. It either works or it doesn't. If it does work, turning 680 into three or four grand would probably be a pretty nice trade. If it doesn't work, you're out 680. Now, remember I told you that the odds of the market turning the maximum profit are slim. That is going to be always going to be true because for that to happen, the futures price would have to be exactly at 1700 at expiration. And we've all followed gold enough to know that it doesn't say to stay at exactly any price for any period of time. So it's not going to happen. If you see, an, if you have a risk reward profile like this, instead of shooting for 4,300, you should probably shoot for 1,000 to 2,000 is probably a little more realistic. And that's if everything goes perfectly. So don't get greedy thinking that you want to squeeze out the entire profit potential. Cause I'll, I'll tell you, if you start thinking like that, you're probably, one of the butterfly is probably never going to pay off for you. So of course you can do the same thing with a call, call fly. This is an example of a 150 point spread on the call side, because the premiums are fatter, you can create a wider spread with bigger profit potential. A little more, it's a little more expensive, but it's, it creates a really big range. So this, in this case, we're buying the 2050, we're selling two of the 2150s, and then we're buying the 2250s. So the trade makes something between 2050 and 2250. So it's a 200 point range or a $200 range that could potentially pay off. The most the trader would lose is what they pay for the spread. You can see the bid ask on this is a little wider but let's assume you get in at $11. So that's $1,100 is your risk. Let's pull up the chart and see what that looks like. So in this situation, the risk is 1100, but the trade pays off. If everything went perfectly, the max profit would be close to 9,000. Again, that's not likely, but I think we can agree that if you get somewhere um, even in the vicinity of that, it'd be pretty exciting. So the max profit would come in at 2150. The trade makes something between 2250 and 2050. This particular uh, option example was put together when gold was on its way up during the summer. So somebody that wanted to buy gold, but was nervous that, you know, just a normal pullback here. Like, let's say you go along a futures contract if your timing isn't perfect, a normal pullback would probably be 1850. You could easily be down 15, 20 grand 
in a couple of days if, if gold decides to correct. So a way to get into gold without taking that kind of risk or worrying about getting stopped out, that's another factor too. When you're trading futures, if you go long a futures and you place a stop order, the odds are, well, not the odds, but there's a decent chance that you get stopped out before the market actually goes the way you wanted it to go. So you don't have to worry about getting stopped out prematurely with an option spread like this. And I, I guess um, one way to put it is you have to be in it to win it. If you're stopped out, you're not in it. If you have an option spread that has no risk of being stopped out, you have, un you have limited risk and you have the potential to maybe have a big payoff if everything goes as planned. Now you don't have to have a huge 200 point profit zone on your call spread. You could do it a little tighter. You could have done the 2050, 2150 spread where you're buying the 2050, selling two 21s and then buying a 2150. In this situation, your risk is only about $4 or $400 your profit potential is closer to five grand. So it's not quite as exciting. And the risk is, uh, I'm sorry, the profit potential isn't as big and the profit zone isn't as big, but for three or $400 risk, um, you're not gonna be out much if it doesn't go well. Here's what that would look like on a chart. Again, you're Profit zone is here. And the way this works is you're buying the 2050. So above 2050, the call starts paying off. When you get to 21, because you're short two calls here, above 21, you're no longer making money on the initial spread because from 2050 to 21, you're making money on basically a vertical spread, right? You're long the 2050, you're short the 21 but you're short 221, so you start giving money back and you run out of money right around here. And thank goodness you have this 2150 call to cap your risk. So you can't lose more than what you paid to get into this spread if the market's up here or down here. But if you're lucky and the futures price falls somewhere in this vicinity, you could pick up a nice payout. So when we're talking about gold markets, like we've seen this year, I've told my clients, I repetit repetitively reminded them, the goal is to just simply not lose your shirt. You don't wanna worry about all the money that you're missing out on when you see the market skyrocketing higher. You wanna make sure you don't lose your shirt. That's really the bottom line. Um, so a trade like this, is a way that you can get into the market. You have some skin in the game. You have some decent profit potential with a low risk, but if things go south, it's not gonna ruin your life. And you're probably not gonna lose sleep at night too. So I'm gonna just skip head to the chart on this one. We've already, this is basically the uh, similar example, but I just wanted to show you, you don't have to necessarily do these spreads near the money. You can do them out of the money. They can kind of be shots in the dark. So in a situation like this, this was earlier this year, gold seems to be getting comfortable right around the 1950-ish area. Honestly, without knowing what we know now, you could easily make an argument for a break either way, right? So a trader might decide to put a butterfly on one side of the market to confirm their bias, but without taking a lot of risk, this trader could have spent $400 on this spread. And if gold did drop and make new lows, they might've made as much as 4,600 if it drops down here. $400 to make 4,600 obviously would be a nice, a nice payout. Again, something like that, if you could, if you could pick up 1,000 to 1,500, I think that'd be considered a home run. Um, with such a small risk. Of course, gold could go higher and it could expire worthless and that sort of thing. But if it does, you're out $400. Again, not the end of the world. You could also, some clients or some traders prefer doing this sort of thing with 
spreads on both sides. So you could do a call spread up here and a put spread down here. And as long as the market doesn't trade sideways, you make something. So that's something to consider as well. So in, in short, butterflies can create a situation where traders can take a shot at picking a direction without taking outsized risk. Very little risk involved in doing this sort of thing. It does take some luck and um, things have to go your way, but again, low risk and big profit potential. So in conclusion, gold doesn't have to be off limits, even if you're trading a very small account. Remember the micro futures that I talked about or the smalls futures? With the smalls futures, the contract size is about seven or 8,000, depending on where the value of those metals are. The margin's less than 500. So even if you have a small account, you know, a couple thousand or even a little less than that, you could trade a smalls contract pretty comfortably. So you don't, it doesn't have to be off limits just because you have a small account or if you're risk averse, gold is a wild market, obviously, but it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be off limits. You can just trade small. You can either use option spreads or you can use the smaller contracts. So hopefully that uh, hopefully you picked up something new today. You got something out of the, the class, whether it's the existence of the smalls contracts or option butterflies or whatever the case is. I've got a few minutes here. If, if there's any questions I can answer, I'd be more than happy to do that. If you're interested in learning more, we have a lot of free educational material on decarlytrading.com. You can sign up for our newsletters. We'll give you, to be honest, the next couple of weeks, we're kind of laying low. It's like I mentioned before, we encourage people not to do a lot of risk taking in December, just because the markets are, are even more unpredictable than they normally are. So we don't do a whole lot. If you sign up for a newsletter trial, we, you probably won't receive anything until after the new year, but we'll just kind of extend your trial and accordingly. Um, but you can kind of follow along, see what we do. We, we do put out detailed trading recommendations and ideas, that sort of thing. And if you want to learn more about option trading, you can visit tradingcommodityoptions.com. On the site, we offer a couple of sample chapters, um, some sample content, that sort of thing, so you get an idea of what it is we're trying to convey in that book. To be honest, it's that book is about 370 pages of solid option information. Of course, I wrote it again, I'm biased, but I'll tell you, we, we sell it for $19.99 as the cover price. It's definitely a $40 book that we're giving away for, not giving away, but we're selling for $19.99 because the idea is we want to just get the information out there. Um, hopefully it helps people. So there it is. The Trading Commodity Options with Creativity. By the way, in this book, we do talk, We obviously we cover butterflies, but we do talk a lot about um, option buying versus option selling, the risks, the rewards, how to put together various trading strategies. I noticed the option professor in the class before us was talking about basically a bull call spread with a naked leg. Um, so we talk about that in the book. We're using the market's money to finance your trades. So somebody's asking what the cost to join the services are. Like we're, again, we're a brokered service. We don't uh, charge to be our client. We just charge commission. Just like if you traded with any other brokerage, you pay a transaction fee every time you trade. That's how we make our living. Um, we just ask that anybody that's receiving our information and our ideas trades with us, of course. Otherwise we wouldn't be in business very long, but there is no cost to be a client of ours other than just transaction costs when you trade. Uh, one other thing to point out is most of the 
ideas that we put out on our newsletters, the trading ideas, they're generally option spreads. They're generally limited risk. Um, a lot, we do a lot of vertical call spreads, a lot of vertical put spreads. We're generally trying to pick a direction. Of course, you know how that goes. Nobody can tell the future. So there's, um, there's always, it's never, no, there's no guarantees. Let me just put it that way. But we've been doing this for a long time. We've learned a lot of hard lessons. So hopefully we can uh, point, point everybody in the right direction. Uh, actually, somebody's asking about using plain calls and puts, not spreads for day trading. That's an excellent question. And I actually talk about this in the book. And we also have on our YouTube channel and on our website, we do have videos that talk about exactly that thing, basically using options to day trade. So if you're bullish and you think the market's going up, instead of going along a futures contract, you can just go and find a weekly call that expires maybe today or tomorrow. Uh, not more than a couple days down the road. So it's a short dated call option. Just buy that call option. And if you're right and the market goes up, that call should increase in value. The idea is you don't have to worry about being stopped out prematurely. It's gonna move slower. It's gonna be less stressful. One thing I've learned about trading is it's a mental game. And so if you're trading in a way that's extremely stressful for you, whether that's buying or selling futures and placing stops and that sort of thing, or being over leveraged, the odds are you're probably gonna make poor decisions. If you are trading in a manner that's comfortable, it doesn't, doesn't um, rile you up, you're probably gonna make better decisions. So buying and selling calls for day trading purposes is actually, in my opinion, a really good uh, thing to consider doing. That said, day trading itself is, can be very difficult. And also anytime you're dealing with options, you have to worry about time value erosion and that sort of thing. So there is no perfect strategy. But the idea is find something that fits your personal personality and your account size and risk tolerance. The minimum to open with us is $2,000. Uh, of course, if you wanted to do, uh, well, the minimum to open is 2000 and um, if you wanted to do, we do actually, our brokerage does house accounts that are capable of selling naked options and option spreads and things like that. Not all brokerage firms will allow you to do that. We do. If you do decide you wanted to trade naked options, we prefer at least five to 10,000, preferably more. If you're going to sell naked options, my opinion is you probably want at least 15 to 20,000 in the account, but that's my opinion. You can do it with a little less. But again, the minimum to open is 2000. Uh, the next question is, would you ever use spreads on expiration day? Me personally, I, that's not, um, I'm not a huge fan of expiration days. In fact, we kind of try to avoid it or if we are recommending a trade on expiration day, it's usually to get in because sometimes on expiration day, you'll see uh, trend exhaustion. So for example, if a market is trending higher, sometimes on expiration day or first notice day of the futures contract, you'll see a really big spike up in the direction of the trend. And then it kind of melts from there. It falls apart and reverses. Not always, but that's kind of a, a pattern that we watch for. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't trade options that expired on that particular day, but on expiration day, I might see an opportunity that I think makes sense to play with options that expire in the future. Hope that answers your question. Okay, well, here, if uh, just as a reminder, here's all my contact information. So if you have questions that I didn't answer or you think of something later, feel free to send me an email or you can give us a call. Um, also check us out on social media. We'd love to see you there. And again, you can sign up for free trials of our newsletters at decarlytrading.com.